All right, everyone. Thanks for coming to the last lecture of oceanography for this term. Today, we're going to continue talking about climate change, uh, really focusing in on recent climate change and what's possibly causing it. So at the end of the day on Wednesday, we had started talking about attempts to reconstruct the climate going back into the past to give some context to what's been happening recently. And we got to the point where we talked a little bit about climate variations over the past few million years, and in particular, mentioning that as within the last million years, there's been this sort of 100,000 year climate cycle going from warm to cold, from lots of ice at the poles to not very much ice at the poles. And that right now we're in a relatively warm period. Warmer than normal, go back 18,000 years, it was very cold, a glacial period. Over the last thousand years, temperatures appear to have been relatively constant, not very quick changes, and what changes there have been are very modest, up until about 1900 to 1950. So in this, older reconstruction is about 10 years old based on things like how quickly are trees growing, how dense is the wood that's formed in those trees, and of course thermometer records where we have thermometer records and other sorts of data, corals and so on. It appears the temperature was very consistent until about the beginning of the 20th century, and then there is a sharp increase over the past 50 years that's still going on today. And this has held up pretty well. Various people have tried to you know, improve on it, look at different types of proxy data, expand the universe of proxy data that are available, more points in more places, and the basic shape hasn't changed. There's significant uncertainty in reconstructing temperatures, particularly once you get back beyond about 100 years ago, but as far as we can tell, what's going on over the past 50 years is unprecedented. Okay. And it amounts to something like a little bit less than one degree Celsius of temperature change and the global average temperature over the past 100 years or so, and mostly over the past 50 years or so. And it seems to be going faster now than it has been at any point. This is a larger temperature increase than has been observed, actually a larger temperature change of any kind than has been observed in the last 1,000 years and, in fact, pushing records farther back probably in the last 2,000 years. And it's important to point out that we saw how the variation in ice volume was going up and down with a 100,000 year time scale with the last glacial maximum being about 18,000 years ago. But it turns out that over the past 10,000 years or so of Earth's history, actually the climate has been fairly stable. It hasn't changed as far as we can tell by more than about two degrees Celsius averaged over the planet. So even on that much larger time scale, what's going on over the past 50 years is actually really unusual. So this is about as large of a temperature shift, particularly on this time scale, as has occurred on the time scale of human civilization. So we can identify bigger shifts, but not any that people were really around to pay attention to. Another point is that looking at various things that might naturally cause the temperature to change, like variability in the sun, there are sunspots and other various cycles that occur on some time scale, the main solar cycle is 22-year time scale. None of these things are obviously able to explain what's been going on over the past 50 or 100 years. Of course, we don't exactly understand everything that controls the climate, but it certainly doesn't appear that, for instance, the same property that controlled the 100,000-year cycle, which has to do with the variation in Earth's orbit, is what's causing the climate change over the past 50 or 100 years. So there's not an obvious natural explanation for what's going on. And that raises the possibility of, should we look for a non-natural cause? Should we look for a human-induced cause for the climate change? Okay. And I'm going to focus in on what we think is the best, like, most likely candidate for what's causing the recent warming. And that is an enhanced atmospheric greenhouse. Okay. So, hopefully most of you have heard this term, greenhouse effect. Let's actually figure out what a greenhouse does before we discuss what a greenhouse effect is. Okay, here's a greenhouse. This is an English greenhouse, but it doesn't matter where it is. They function the same way. In fact, greenhouses can be made out of glass. They can be made out of plastic. That doesn't really matter very much. The functionally important thing about a greenhouse is that it's transparent to light so that sunshine can get in. So that's property number one of a greenhouse. Sunlight can get in. It hits the floor. It heats up the floor. It, of course, allows the plants inside the greenhouse to do photosynthesis and it warms it up. 
And the critical thing is that when something gets warm, it tends to radiate away that heat as a form of light, but a form of light that has a very long wavelength, a different wavelength than sunlight because it's colder. And so the critical thing about glass and about plastic and actually lots of things that appear clear to our eyes is that light can pass through them, but longer wavelengths, infrared heat radiation, can't. It gets blocked. It gets scattered. And that's certainly true of glass and plastic in greenhouses. Sunlight can get in, but as the ground inside the gr greenhouse warms up and tries to radiate away some of that heat, that heat actually gets trapped by the same glass that let the light in in the first place. Okay, so the fundamental feature of a greenhouse is that light can get in, but heat radiation can't get back out, or at least not very easily. So the greenhouse as a net result ends up being warmer than the land around it. Okay, and the basic idea is that the Earth and our atmosphere in particular functions as a greenhouse of a sort. Okay, so we can think of the Earth as being inside of a glass jar where the glass jar is actually our atmosphere. And the basic idea is we don't have glass surrounding our planet, of course, but we do have things in our atmosphere, molecules in our atmosphere, that have a similar property. They let light pass through from the sun, but they prevent the heat radiation coming off the Earth from getting back out again. And so as a net result, heat can get in, can't get out very easily, and so the planet warms up. Okay? And it turns out that the most critical molecules in our atmosphere, there are actually a number of them, but the most critical ones are carbon dioxide and water vapor. And I've shown you a couple of little pictures of these guys, carbon dioxide and water vapor, and they're vibrating, right? And it turns out that that's how they prevent the heat from getting out. They vibrate. Here we can see the carbon and CO2 going up and down, up and down, and the oxygen's kind of going in the opposite direction. Well, in a molecule of carbon dioxide, Carbon has a little bit of a positive charge on it, and oxygen has a little bit of a negative charge on it. And of course, we've already talked about po partial charges on water. There's a little bit of a negative charge on the oxygen, a little bit of a positive charge on the hydrogen. So as these things are bending, they're like little antennas with positive and negative charges moving in opposite directions. Okay? And light, any kind of electromagnetic radiation, is an electric field going up and down. Okay? So you can think of it as if these are acting like little antennas, little radio antennas. When the light hits them, it has an electric field going up and down, just like a radio wave, and they can start to vibrate in time and actually gain energy from that electromagnetic wave energy as it go, passes by. And it intercepts that energy and actually puts it into the molecule. And it might scatter it away, or it might just heat up the molecule until it collides with something else and gives off some of that heat. The important thing is, because they can act kind of like antennas, they prevent that electromagnetic radiation from passing through. It can't get out. It gets stopped by these guys. Okay. And we can see this. You don't have to take my word for it. Okay, so what we're looking at here is a spectrum of light passing through the Earth's atmosphere, through our air. And there are two, actually four spectra here, but two types of spectrum here. This is the spectrum we expect from our sun which is very hot. The surface of the sun is like 5,500 degrees Celsius, really, really hot. And hot things tend to radiate light at relatively short wavelengths. Okay? So the light that's coming from the sun is kind of centered at a wavelength of something less than one millionth of a meter, roughly speaking, half a millionth of a meter, which is the light we can see. That's the characteristic wavelength of light we can see with our eyes. And you can see here, what's plotted is the intensity or effectively how much of that light can make it through our atmosphere to the ground. And that's what's shown in the filled in red here. And you can see that most of that light that's coming in underneath this red curve is actually making it down to the ground, okay? The atmosphere is transparent to sunlight, more or less. And that's not a big surprise, right? You go out on a sunny day, hey, there's the sun, you can see it. The Earth's surface is much colder than the sun. We're not at 5,000 degrees Celsius, which is a good thing. We're at like a few degrees Celsius, okay? And these three curves are basically showing the heat that would be radiated by the Earth's surface at various temperatures ranging from minus 60 degrees Celsius to plus 40 degrees Celsius. 
because of course the temperature of the Earth varies from place to place. And the important thing here is there's only a little bit of this light that can actually get out. The rest of it gets intercepted. Okay? Light gets through our atmosphere from the sun much more efficiently than heat radiation gets back out again. And in particular, if we look at what's getting intercepted in the atmosphere, there's lots of light getting intercepted here at wavelengths of a few millionths of a meter, and there's lots of light getting intercepted at wavelengths that are a little bit more than 10 millionths of a meter. And in particular, two of the most effective things that's stopping the light from getting out, of, or the heat radiation from getting out from the Earth's surface to space is this particular vibration of water vapor, which corresponds to light with a wavelength of about six millionths of a meter. And this vibration of carbon dioxide, which is very good at intercepting light with a wavelength of about 15 millionths of a meter. Okay, so those two guys are very good at preventing heat radiation from getting out from the Earth to space, from cooling us off. And as a result, these two guys, they actually fall in the right energy range to absorb the heat radiation coming off the Earth's surface. And there are other things, too. In fact, CO2 and water vapor aren't the only greenhouse gases in our atmosphere. Any gas is a greenhouse gas if it occurs in the atmosphere, if it has at least three atoms, or if it has two different kinds of elements in it. So actually, most things you would think of as gases, perhaps, are greenhouse gases. The exceptions are things like nitrogen and oxygen, which is a bad greenhouse gas, and argon. But pretty much everything else you can think of, methane, nitrous oxide, hydrocarbons, those are all actually greenhouse gases. They tend not to be as important simply because they're not as abundant. Okay, so the Earth has a greenhouse atmosphere. It lets sunlight through, but it doesn't let heat radiation back out, at least not very efficiently. So the net result is that the Earth's surface tends to heat up. And that's actually a good thing. Based on how far we are away from the sun and how brightly the sun shines, if we didn't have a greenhouse ga gas atmosphere, the surface temperature on the Earth would average something like minus 20 or minus 30 degrees Celsius. It would be really cold pretty much everywhere on the Earth if we didn't have a greenhouse. So a little greenhouse is a good thing. It makes it a place that's suitable for life, prevents the oceans from freezing over, etc. The problem, of course, is that if the abundance of greenhouse gases increase, or if the greenhouse for some other reason becomes more efficient, the Earth's surface is going to tend to warm up, and that could become a problem. Okay? And what we observe for CO2, which is one of the most important of these greenhouse gases, is that it actually is increasing as a function of time. This is a famous record from Mauna Loa. We actually have a number of sites where we're collecting abundance data for CO2 in the atmosphere year by year, actually month by month. This is just one particular record. And what you can see here is that in 1957 or so, CO2 made up about 315 parts per million of our atmosphere. But that abundance has increased more or less steadily, but at an increasing rate over time, so that today it is very close to 390 parts per million. So it's gone up by something like 25% or so over the past 40 or 50 years. So one thing to ask is, OK, greenhouse gases are increasing in abundance. That might plausibly cause the climate to become warmer. Can we put some more context to what happens before 1957? This is really a way you can change the climate. And so we're again going to look at an older record of greenhouse gases and try to figure out, is there a correlation, as we might expect, between the abundance of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and climate? The expectation is the greenhouse becomes more efficient, which you might make it by putting in more gas that's capable of scattering heat radiation. The planet should warm up, or something along those lines. There should be a correlation. And it turns out we have pretty good records of both of those things. For instance, from ice cores, which I've shown a picture of here. Ice has water in it. Water has oxygen. And we can play a game with oxygen isotopes, much like we did with those benthic foraminiferas. In this case, it actually goes in the opposite direction. More O18 actually indicates warmer temperatures for ice cores. But the basic idea is nonetheless similar. And in addition, these ice cores were originally formed from snow that fell on the surface of the ice caps. And it turns out that gas actually gets trapped between the individual snowflakes. 
And as the ice gets compressed, as more and more snow falls on top of it, those little crevices between snowflakes eventually turn into trapped bubbles. And so we can actually simultaneously analyze the water in the ice and figure out what the temperature was like and analyze the gas trapped in the bubbles in the ice and figure out what the atmosphere was made out of. And there's some tricks involved. It turns out that the trapping of the gases doesn't quite occur at the very top. It occurs at some depth. So the gas that's trapped in the ice is actually a little bit younger than the ice itself. But we think we can make a correction for those kinds of things. Okay? And this is an example of a high resolution record because snow falls on the ice caps more or less every year. And we actually have records that go back quite far. So it's good in both ways. High resolution record and it goes back at least a few hundred thousand years. The best record we have is from Antarctica. This is an example of a record from Antarctica with some other data plotted. And there are lots of things here that you don't have to worry about. This is the oxygen isotope composition of benthic foraminifera. We've already seen this curve except now it's going from old on the left to young on the right. And we can see that today we have relatively little O18 in these things, indicating that we're in a warm period and that it was cold about 20,000 years ago. What's really interesting is that this record of the size of the ice caps correlates very nicely, for instance, with the record of how much CO2 is in the air that's trapped between the ice crystals. You can see that the bumps and wiggles actually line up very well, that in particular, warm periods correspond to periods when there's lots of CO2 trapped in the ice. So there really does seem to be a good correlation between temperature and the abundance of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. In detail, there are some complications, in particular, that the greenhouse gases aren't quite in sync with temperature. Temperature may actually start to rise before greenhouse gases start to rise, the suggestion being that there's some feedback between those two if you warm things up you get more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere for one reason or another. And other greenhouse gases, as it turns out, actually correlate fairly well also, like methane, and to a certain extent, like nitrous oxide. Okay, so there definitely seems to be a correlation. Lots of greenhouse gases seems to correlate with an improved greenhouse effect or a more effective greenhouse, thus higher temperatures. Hello. is what I wanted to show. Okay. So this is record from an ice core. However, I just told you that over the past 50 years, CO2 has gone from being about 320 parts per million in our atmosphere to about 390 parts per million in our atmosphere. This curve, the red CO2 curve, actually tops out in this record at about 300 or so. So where we are today is actually way above where we've been at any point in the last 600,000 years. In fact, any point we've been in the last 800,000 years. There's more CO2 in the atmosphere today and more methane, which is a greenhouse gas, and more nitrous oxide, which is also a greenhouse gas, more of all of those greenhouse gases in the atmosphere today than there has been at any point in the last 600,000 years of Earth's history. So not only is this climate change that we are experiencing over the past 30 or 40 or 50 years, unprecedented in the time scale of human civilization, the effectiveness of our greenhouse is actually unprecedented over the last 600,000 years of Earth's history. So something really strange really is going on now. Let's look in more detail at what's going on recently. It turns out that CO2 and the abundances of other greenhouse gases have only started going up towards these unprecedented levels pretty recently. For instance, CO2 at the pre-industrial age, like 1750 or something like that, was actually pretty close to where it is in those ice cores going back five, six, seven thousand years. But particularly in the 20th century, it started shooting up. So this unprecedented thing, the abundance of greenhouse gases in our atmosphere, is actually a recent phenomenon. And it actually corresponds with industrialization and the rise of the human population on Earth. In fact, we can correlate the amount of CO2 that's been added to the atmosphere with records of burning of fossil fuels. There's actually a pretty good match between those two things. What's shown here in blue is the amount of carbon that's been burned in the form of coal and oil and natural gas, various forms of fossil fuels. And what's shown in red is the amount of CO2 you would have to add to the atmosphere to explain this increase. So just given the size of the atmosphere and how much CO2 has increased, 
how much carbon do you have to have added to the atmosphere in the form of CO2, that's what this red line is. And you can see that these two lines actually correspond quite well, but there's actually not quite as much CO2 in the atmosphere as you would expect based on the amount of fossil fuel burning. We burn more than enough fossil fuel to explain the extra CO2 in the atmosphere. It actually turns out we're getting a little bit lucky because of oceanography, or the ocean itself, which is sucking up some of the extra CO2 because carbon dioxide is relatively soluble in water, particularly water that has a fairly high pH, like the ocean does, it's a little bit basic. And so actually some of that extra CO2 that's being pumped out into the atmosphere by burning fossil fuels is dissolving into the ocean and not accumulating to enhance the greenhouse effect. There's also possibilities that CO2 is fertilizing plants because of course it's a nutrient for photo photosynthesis and there may be enhanced rates of photosynthesis as a result. The division of those two things, how much of the CO2 is going into the ocean and how much is going into extra photosynthesis is an area of active research, but they both appear to be significant. Okay. So a curve like this and just the timing hopefully gives you this idea that it seems plausible that the extra CO2 in the atmosphere is there because of human activity. It's because of fossil fuel burning, perhaps land use changes, biofuels burning, deforestation, okay? And that that's the most likely source of the extra CO2 to the atmosphere. But that doesn't quite convince everybody. And so there are actually other tests you can come up with to give additional evidence that this CO2 is actually coming from human activity. It's not some natural phenomenon like a volcano erupting, and we know that CO2 comes out when volcanoes erupt, but we can pretty well rule out volcanic activity as the cause of the extra CO2 in the atmosphere. First of all, because there's no evidence that there's been extra volcanoes erupting over the past 200 years. That's kind of an obvious thing, but we can actually do better than that. We can, again, look at isotopes. In this case, the isotopes of carbon instead of the isotopes of oxygen. Carbon comes in three isotopes. There's carbon-12, which is like 99% of all carbon. There's carbon-13, which has an extra neutron, and that's about 1% of all carbon. And some of you may have heard of carbon-14, which is used for like carbon-14 dating of archeological stuff. That turns out to be a radioactive isotope of carbon. It has a half-life of about 6,000 years, and it's really, really rare. It's like one part in a trillion of natural carbon. What we're going to be talking about here is carbon-13 and carbon-12, the more common isotopes of carbon. And in particular, what we observe is that when organisms do photosynthesis, when they take CO2 and use it to build their bodies, to build sugars, they preferentially do that chemical work on the light isotope of carbon, carbon-12. And so biological materials are characteristically depleted in C13. We're depleted in C13. In fact, you can tell what your diet is by measuring your carbon isotope composition, because it turns out that corn is a little bit less effective at concentrating carbon-12 than other kinds of plants are. And so if you've eaten lots of corn-fed beef, your body's gonna actually have a different carbon isotope composition than somebody who's been eating fruits and vegetables their whole life. Okay. And it turns out that this is actually one way we can figure out where the CO2 is coming from. Because other sources of carbon dioxide besides the burning of fossil fuels, which ultimately come from material that was photosynthesized, volcanoes, their carbon isotope composition is similar to the bulk earth. It's got relatively large amounts of C13 in it because it hasn't been through photosynthesis. Likewise, it turns out that concrete, which is a potential source of CO2 to the atmosphere, also tends to have lots of CO C13 released when it's made. So what we should expect is if we're increasing the CO2 content of the atmosphere by burning fossil fuels and biomass, things that have been produced by photosynthesis, then we should expect that as the CO2 abundance in the atmosphere increases, the C13 abundance in the atmosphere should decrease because the stuff we're adding by burning is photosynthesized material that's C13 depleted. And that's exactly what we see. If we look, for instance, at the past 15 or 20 years, as CO2 has increased, the abundance of C13, which is what's plotted on the y-axis here, is actually decreased. So this is a fingerprint. The carbon that's being added to the atmosphere in the form of CO2 is carbon that's come from biological materials that have presumably either been biomass that's burned, like forests, or things like coal and oil, which are buried organic material from some point in the geological past not volcanoes. 
Okay. So this is where we've gotten. It appears that the Earth's climate is warming up, particularly over the past 50 years, at kind of an unprecedented rate, at least on the time scale of human civilization. It appears that that warming correlates with an increase in the abundances of greenhouse gases in our atmosphere, in particular CO2. And that CO2 certainly appears to be getting into the atmosphere through human activity, both by abundance and by its isotopic composition, it matches up with sources caused by human activity. However, this isn't clearly the whole story. In particular, we have models for how effective CO2 is as a greenhouse gas. And if we take those models and just say, okay, we're just gonna increase the CO2 by the amount we've increased it, how much should the climate change? And the answer is, actually, it shouldn't change by as much as we've observed it to. CO2 by itself isn't the whole story. And even if we consider that methane and nitrous oxide and some other gases have increased in abundance, that's still not quite enough. Okay, so there's an additional question that has to be answered. The amount of CO2 and other greenhouse gases that we've added to the atmosphere by burning fossil fuels and other activities isn't quite enough to explain how much the temperature has changed over the past 50 years. We have to worry about actually feedbacks in the system. If we increase the abundance of greenhouse gases and warm the planet up, does that maybe increase the abundance of other greenhouse gases or somehow otherwise change the ability of the Earth to get radiation from the sun in the form of light or reduce our ability to lose that heat to space? Okay, so it's important to consider feedbacks and in particular two types of feedbacks. A positive feedback is an example would be like if you had a bowling ball and it was on top of a hill. And if you perched it very precariously, just right, even though it was on the top of the hill, it might not roll. If you found the very top of the hill where the ground was locally a little bit level and it was kind of in between some grains in the asphalt, right? It might be slightly stable. But if you give it a little push, it starts rolling and then it's not on top of the hill anymore, it's on the side of the hill. And it just rolls straight down the bottom of the hill. That would be an example of a positive feedback. You displace the system a little bit by pushing the bowling ball a little bit, and it finds itself in a region where it's actually compelled to go farther in the same direction that you pushed it, and in fact accelerates in that direction. Okay, so you take a ball, you push it off the top of the hill, it goes all the way to the bottom of the hill, you don't actually have to push it very hard because the hill does most of the work for you once you get it started. Negative feedback means that the system responds to a perturbation by fighting against, fighting against it. And that would be analogous to having a bowling ball at the bottom of the hill, right? And then if you push the bowling ball a little bit, it rolls up the hill a little bit, but the hill's pushing it back the other way, so it just rolls back again, goes back and forth, and ends up right back where it started, right? So in that case, you perturb the system by pushing your bowling ball, and it ends up right back where it started. There's a negative feedback. The system tends to want to put the bowling ball back where it started. So we have to worry about both of these things. Is it the case that if we add CO2 to the atmosphere and enhance the greenhouse, that that actually changes the atmosphere in a way that makes it an even more effective greenhouse and tends to warm the atmosphere? Or is it the case that as we add CO2 to the atmosphere, the atmosphere responds in such a way that it makes it a less effective greenhouse gas? And these actually both turn out to be important, but it's positive feedbacks that we worry about. And there's one very important positive feedback, which I've actually kind of given you the elements of, but I haven't talked about it directly. So I gave you two examples of greenhouse gases, right? CO2 and water vapor, but I didn't talk about sources of water vapor. That's because it turns out, as a direct influence of human activity, we don't actually do much to the atmospheric water vapor budget. Water vapor only lasts in the atmosphere for a few days. It tends to condense into clouds and fall back out again. It's true that when you're driving your car down the road, you're burning fossil fuels, you're making CO2, you're also making water vapor because there's hydrogen in that fossil fuel as well as carbon. But the water vapor gets up into the atmosphere, only lives there for a few days and then falls right back out again. It doesn't really accumulate there just because you're driving your car. The carbon dioxide that comes out of your tailpipe stays in the atmosphere for something like 100 years. So there's lots of time for that to accumulate. Water vapor, not so much. It doesn't live long enough in the atmosphere to accumulate directly as a result of human activity, but it does accumulate in the atmosphere because of indirect effects, because of a feedback. In particular, if we add some CO2 to the atmosphere, we're enhancing the greenhouse effect a little bit, right? So the surface temperature of the Earth warms up a little bit. 
And what happens to air when it gets warm? Can warm air hold more or less water vapor than cold air? It can hold more. So if you warm up the atmosphere, all else being equal, you might expect the air to be holding on to more water vapor. Right? It's more effective at evaporating water and holding on to it. And so the water content of the atmosphere goes up simply because the temperature is changing. And water vapor is an effective greenhouse gas. So as you warm the atmosphere, you increase the abundance of water vapor, which enhances the greenhouse ability of the atmosphere, which tends to warm it up, which makes it evaporate more water, which makes it a more effective greenhouse gas, which tends to warm it up even more. So that's an example of a positive feedback. We warm up the atmosphere a little bit, and we increase the abundance of water vapor, which is itself a greenhouse gas, which warms up the atmosphere even more. Right? So we perturb the system a little bit, and it actually perturbs itself even farther through a positive feedback. Here's another positive feedback. Let's say we warm up the planet a little bit, and we've already seen this, that the ice caps, particularly in the Arctic, but elsewhere as well, are shrinking. And what do we know about ice? It's light-colored in general. It isn't very good at absorbing sunlight energy. It tends to reflect it. That's why it's so bright-colored. So when a part of the Earth's surface is covered by ice and snow, it tends to reflect a lot of the energy from the sun right back out into space. That energy isn't absorbed, and it doesn't cause the planet to heat up. If you take that ice-covered area and you shrink it by warming up the planet a little bit, you're replacing some of the bright ice with presumably darker covered, darker colored ground surface or vegetation or ocean, which is going to tend to absorb sunlight energy and convert it to heat. So as the planet warms up, the ice covered area should shrink. The planet's albedo, its ability to hold on to and absorb sunlight energy increases. And so we're just absorbing more sunlight energy. And so we should expect the planet to heat up and thus cause the ice caps to contract even more, and so on and so forth. So this is another example of a positive feedback. As the planet warms up, it becomes darker in color. And as it becomes darker in color, it tends to absorb more energy from the sun. OK, so two very important positive feedbacks. As the planet warms, more atmosphere in the atmosphere, so more water vapor in the atmosphere, which is a greenhouse gas. As the planet warms up, Ice-covered area decreases, so the planet intercepts more sunlight energy. Okay, that's not the whole story, though. There are important negative feedbacks, which is good. Otherwise, we'd be totally doomed, right? The planet would just keep warming up until it became a cinder. But there are negative feedbacks, and one of the most important ones, the most fundamental one, is the radiative feedback. As the planet warms up, it just tends to radiate more stuff away. Hot things radiate heat much more effectively than cold things do. You know this. If you've ever taken a hot poker and stuck it into a fire, it starts to glow red after a while. It's giving off so much energy through radiation, you can actually see it with your eye. In fact, hot things in general do this. An electric stove, lava, they glow because they're actually giving out a lot of radiant energy because they're so hot. And as the Earth warms up, its ability to lose heat to space through radiation actually increases very quickly. So that's a very important negative feedback. As the planet warms up, it tends to lose heat more effectively that way. OK. Some feedbacks we know are probably important, but we don't, it's not so easy to classify them as positive or negative. They may be both at the same time, or depending on what the conditions are like, they may be one or the other. And a really important example is clouds. Clouds are bright colored. So if you have lots of clouds, you might expect lots of sunlight energy to be reflected back out into space. So that would be what kind of feedback? Negative. If you increase the number of clouds, you're decreasing the ability of the Earth to intercept energy from the sun. You're going to tend to cool the planet back down again. However, particularly clouds that are not super thick, like we think of storm clouds, but high, very cold clouds, are actually perhaps more effective at intercepting energy trying to get out to space than they are at intercepting energy coming in from the sun. Because, in part, they're so cold. And so in that case, they actually prevent heat from getting out from the Earth. And they may actually function as a positive feedback. It depends on where the cloud is and how thick it is. It could be a negative feedback if it's a low kind of rain cloud, or it could be a positive feedback if it's a high wispy cloud in the cold part of the atmosphere. 
And much of the work in climate modeling over the past few decades has actually been concentrating on doing this. It's thought we have a reasonable approach to it, but by no means the final word. Okay. So I've talked about some feedbacks. I've talked about how we know where the greenhouse gases are coming from. What happens if we put all these things together? Feedbacks, the changes in greenhouse gases. Can we actually make sense of the climate change that we've observed over the past 50 years? And the answer in a qualified way is yes. If we take what we think we know about how greenhouse gases work, about how ice covered areas change, and put those all together in a model that we think accounts for them all quantitatively, and say, okay, we're gonna increase the CO2 as we've observed it to increase in the atmosphere and the other greenhouse gases as we've observed them to increase in the atmosphere, does the climate model actually reproduce what's actually happening in our climate? And what I'm showing here is an example for one particular model. This is a Department of Energy climate model. And the black line here is the observed temperature changes over the past 100 years or so. And the more fading line is what the computer model says should have happened to the climate given the increases in greenhouse gases and the various feedbacks that result from those increases. And in fact, the nice thing about a computer model is you can say, okay, which increase, which greenhouse gas, which feedback is causing how much of the temperature change? And that's kind of what's shown here with all these colored lines. Okay? And it includes various things. So greenhouse gases have been going up. And sure enough, as greenhouse gases increase in the atmosphere, the temperature goes up. That accounts basically for the increase in temperature. But that's not the only thing that's going on. There have been volcanic eruptions. They put out CO2. They also put out things like aerosols, sulfates, that can prevent sunlight from reaching the Earth's surface. So those have somewhat of an effect on the climate. But they haven't really caused an increase in our temperature, as far as we can tell. And then sulfate from things like coal burning forms these little aerosol particles high up in the atmosphere that actually reflect away some sunlight and cool the planet down. And as we burn more and more coal, in fact, the amount of sulfate in the atmosphere has increased, and that's tended to cool the planet off. But greenhouse gases are winning, okay? As the abundance of greenhouse gases, particularly CO2 in the atmosphere, have increased, the temperature has increased, and in fact, there's a very good match in the magnitude of those two things. Pollution from coal burning, the sulfate pollution, is actually kind of helping us a little bit, which is disconcerting because there are other reasons we don't want that sulfate around. Okay. So it appears that we can actually kind of understand all these feedbacks, all these increases in greenhouse gases and how they affect the climate. So what happens if we plug in not what's happened over the past 100 years, but what we expect to happen in the next 100 years? We expect CO2 to be increasing in the atmosphere because of human activity, right? We're still burning fossil fuels. We're still clearing forests. Well, here's a series of models, eight of them. There are many of these. And all of these models are calculated from 1900 to 2100, so about 100 years from today, assuming a scenario where the abundance of CO2 in the atmosphere continues to increase. And this scenario is kind of a moderately pessimistic scenario. It's assuming that there really isn't an effective treaty to control greenhouse gas emissions, for instance. And under that scenario, starting from today, or actually when this report was released, the expectation is that temperature will continue to increase. The best guess is something like two to five degrees Celsius by the year 2100, which is something like three to five times as much as it's increased already. So we've already been through something unprecedented in the course of human history. We're about to do something that's much bigger. And it's important to realize that this scenario is was originally considered a kind of a pessimistic scenario for how much CO2 and other greenhouse gases would be added to the atmosphere. Since this model came out in 2001, I think, these results, we've been tracking CO2. It's actually increasing a little bit faster than the pessimistic scenario. So this is actually looking like it's pretty close to what's happening, at least till today. OK. So taking these projections and using a variety of assumptions about how much CO2 we're going to continue to add to the atmosphere, it looks like we're going to be able to expect a temperature increase of something like 1 to 6 degrees Celsius over the next century, assuming the models continue to perform as well as they have in reproducing what's happened over the past 100 years. So 
as much as the Earth has changed in the last 50 years, it's going to probably change even more in the next 100. And it's pretty likely that that's going to be the biggest thing that's happened to the Earth's climate, not just in the course of human civilization, but in fact since the last ice age ended. Okay. So how does oceanography come into play? Well, I already actually talked about this a little bit. The ocean's actually kind of saving our bacon, at least so far, because it's sucking up some of the extra CO2, turns out. One thing going forward we want to know is, is it going to continue sucking up that CO2? Is its ability to suck up CO2 going to end at some point? Is it going to get saturated? Eventually this will happen, by the way, but it's not clear how quickly it will happen. CO2 not just, doesn't just get a, absorbed into the ocean by dissolution, but it also gets processed by photosynthesis. An interesting question to ask is, as the abundance of CO2 in the atmosphere increases, is photosynthesis going to start happening faster? Right? Temperatures go up, more nutrients available maybe, maybe things start growing on that CO2 faster and actually pull it out of the atmosphere. As the ocean warms up, warm water can't dissolve gas as effectively as cold water, maybe that will impede its ability to dissolve CO2 from the atmosphere. Maybe it's this ability to sink, to save us, is actually decreasing as it warms up over time. Okay? And finally, the ocean circulates on its own time scale, which is pretty long compared to 50 or 100 years. So over time, what's going to happen on that longer scale? What's going to happen not just between now and the year 2050, but between now and the year 3000? The CO2 that we're dissolving in the ocean now it's going to be there, perhaps for a thousand years or more. So even if we stopped emitting CO2 to the atmosphere, it's going to keep slowly bubbling back out of the ocean for a long, long time to come. Okay. So what are the consequences? It's difficult to know, particularly on regional and local scales, what's going to happen as the global climate changes. How does that propagate down to the effectiveness of farmers in raising corn or soybeans, for instance? or the migratory habits of important wildlife? Well, there are a few things we can say with some confidence. One of them is exactly what I've showed you, that one of the areas of the Earth that's most sensitive to changes in the global climate appears to be the poles, and in particular the North Pole, because that's in part the area where this ice albedo feedback occurs, where as you reduce the area covered by ice in the summer, its temperature is going to tend to warm up pretty quickly. And it had been said for a while that we should expect the ice coverage in the Arctic during the summer to decrease by something like 20% in the next few decades. Well, that's been changed. 2007 was such a bizarre year. The ice cap shrinks so quickly and so far that now people talk about possibly the Arctic Ocean becoming ice-free every summer in the next 20 or 30 years. Okay, so it's kind of a bummer, but there are some things we can do. And there are some things that have actually already been done. One thing we can do, or one thing that's been done, is the Kyoto Treaty, which is the first global treaty that set out to reduce emissions of greenhouse gases, or at least to stabilize them. And it was a limited treaty. It particularly restricted developed countries, like the United States and Europe and Japan, for instance, to try to reduce their CO2 emissions and other greenhouse gas emissions below where they were, let's say, in 1990, by some target date, which I think is 2010. So basically that would serve to say, okay, wherever you were in 1990, try to get back there by 2010. Stop growing CO2 emissions. But it really only applied to developed countries. It, the restrictions for developing countries like China, India, and elsewhere were much less restrictive. And that was passed and in fact ratified and went into effect in the middle part of this decade. But it was only a start. We're still adding CO2 to the atmosphere. It's not perhaps growing as quickly as it otherwise would have, but we should expect the abundance of CO2 in the atmosphere to continue to increase, even if everybody does what Kyoto tells them to do. So it doesn't solve the problem, it just prevents it from getting worse quite as quickly as it otherwise would have. There's discussion about what are the economic ramifications of trying to slow down CO2 emissions. You make CO2 by doing things like driving cars and producing electricity powering the economic engine of the world, improving people's lives in lots of ways. But it's important to realize that, and particularly as Southern Californians we should realize, that reducing emissions of CO2 actually has benefits. For instance, 
a lot of the CO2 that's emitted in Los Angeles comes from tailpipe emissions, which are also the same things that cause smog and soot and other unpleasantries of living in the Southern California area. So if we can reduce CO2 emissions by, for instance, making more efficient cars or making electric cars, we're gonna solve some other problems that we're interested in. So that's clearly relevant to the LA Basin. That's where we are, and in fact, there's gonna be another meeting to set up hopefully the next treaty in Copenhagen coming up very soon. Very soon. All right, that's it. Thank you very much for coming. I will see you next week for the final, if not before. <laughs>